Welcome everyone. This is Debbie Mabier with National Kitchen and Bath Association. Today's session is called Outdoor Man, Designing Your Next Kitchen or Bath Outside with Allie Man. She's the senior designer with Case Design. And Allie, if you're there, we're ready to get started. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you so much, Debbie, for having me here today. And so great to see you guys, even though I can't see you, and talk to you about um, kitchen and bath design. So this is Outdoor Man, Designing Your Next Kitchen and Bath Outside Space. And, oops, sorry, bear with me a second. And I want to tell you a little bit about myself and why I'm qualified to talk to you about kitchen and bath design um, and the exteriors uh, especially. Um, I'm an allied member of ASID, so the American Society of Interior Design. I am also um, CAP certified through NAHB. I am CKBR through um, my NERI membership. I'm also a member of NKBA. I have my BFA in interior design from James Madison University. And as Debbie mentioned, I am a senior designer um, at Case Design. Um, we're Washington DC, excuse me, Washington DC based. I have been part of the Case family since um, 2005. So a little bit of time there. And also um, I teach at Northern Virginia Community College, that's NVCC. And I have been a member of that faculty um, for the last 10 years where I teach introduction to interior design. And I also teach kitchen um, and bath design. And I wrote that pilot program for them um, sometime um, ago. This past fall, I was also featured um, in HGTV's Flipper Flock um, remix, um, which aired during the, um, the, the show on, on Thursday nights at 9 p.m. And I also most recently gave this presentation um, at KBiz in Las Vegas um, for the voices of the industry. And what I want to talk with you um, today about is the next big or not so new big thing or design trend, which is um, outdoor kitchens and bathrooms. What I also wanted to mention before I go any further with this presentation is that it is highly visual and there are a lot of great images in here. Um, some, many are from um, myself and my company, others are not. And I did my best to um, tag um, and give credit where credit is due for all of those images um, as I could find them. Some I could not find reliable sources for, but I did just want to make um, mention of that as, as well, that I did, I did tag all the images um, to the best of my ability that you're going to see in this presentation. What this presentation is going to go over today is to review current um, lifestyle trends that influence and promote the need for this type of outdoor living experience, to classify key design elements to a successful outdoor kitchen or bath space, to identify um, current features and styles of these spaces, and to discuss appropriate materials to specify for these types of spaces. Um, additionally, I wanna mention that um, the image and, and, and setup for this presentation are about two thirds kitchen based, one third um, bath based. And this is what this presentation is going to cover. So starting for it, like why are we interested in um, outdoor kitchen and bath design? So take the DC market where I am from. The DC market has seen an increase in outdoor activities recently, probably over the last five to 10 years. Um, this notion of promoting healthy lifestyles, this idea or concept that gym memberships and classes are not only be sort of relegated to a gym space, but that they're picking up um, in local parks or local outdoor areas and common spaces where these types of activities could occur. occur. Um, in DC, as I mentioned, we have the resurrection and the reconstruction of the wharf that was otherwise an undesirable part of the city for the last 20 years. And it's seen this huge transformation in outdoor life and activity as well. And the other idea too is, uh, like I said, in my city, but also your cities as well, um, the idea of free activities left and right, encouraging folks to move and get outside. Um, for instance, my family enjoys story times um, in the sculpture gardens um, in DC with our little girls as part of the, um, the Smithsonian exhibits. And also too, our seasons to seem to have blurred a little bit. Sure, we celebrate summer, typically Memorial Day to Labor Day, but we see ourselves utilizing these outdoor spaces really anywhere from an April to October um, sort of footprint before you need to think about winterizing or coming back inside. Again, in DC where I'm from, um, we're celebrating this view. If you're not familiar with this view, this is um, what folks see when they come to um, engage in our 4th of July festivities um, on the mall and the surrounding monuments. And for 
many folks, like I said, um, outside the DC area, we might have a waterfront view or surrounding area, um, and folks want to take advantage of this. Everyone that has this view doesn't want to travel on that 4th of July holiday. They want to stay put where they are and host that next big party um, or event. Also, too, if you're living um, in maybe the Virginia footprint of the, um, the district as you were, um, you could enjoy outdoor living. We're so close to Reagan Airport. Some folks might want to celebrate and watch the, the planes take off and land. It's really something being so close to the airport there. And this other sort of idea of um, folks like feeling and being connected to part of their neighborhood footprint. Um, again, it could be um, enjoying the street sounds from your busy rooftop deck or some of that city nightlife you could enjoy if you live further out from the city. It could be the actual peacefulness that comes with the surroundings um, and nature around you. And um, speaking of nature, right, we as humans, we have this inherent need for nature. Um, nature's a really strong antidepressant. Um, in my interior design class that I teach earlier this semester, um, the introduction to interior design, we start um, with chapter one, of course, and chapter one is called the value of interior design. And one of the common themes we identify is this need for nature. And there's great discussion questions that lead to um, how we explain this innate desire to um, spend time outdoors and how, it, um, how that desire relates to our design. And of course, here we are sort of celebrating that in outdoor kitchen and bath design. So that's a little background there. We also got some statistics and data to back it up, right? So according to Remodeler Magazine, um, backyard decks and patios are seeing a rise in their cost recouped. Um, as you can see the DC market where I'm from, I just highlighted that, um, it's trending upward and it's trending upward in many other um, spaces and regions of the country as well. We also see some other um, stats from AIA, the American Institute of Architects. This um, sort of graph and chart here sort of identifies the popularity of top three specialty room functions from 2012 to 2017. And as you can see, um, outdoor living is outpacing that of mud rooms and home offices even as specialty spaces that folks are looking to um, invest in. And then there's sort of this other idea and notion that everyone's talking about it. You're hearing and seeing the idea of outdoor kitchens and bathrooms in industry shelter magazines, wealth management magazines, the web, social media, finance groups, cookbooks, designers, your friends even, maybe some influencers you follow on social media, and of course celebrities too. So, you know, it's not unreasonable that you could read something on house and then somehow be connected to um, a link maybe maybe you pick up and see um, there, there's a blog even um, a blog spot by uh, by Quicken Loans talking to you about trending outdoor kitchen and bath design ideas and then giving you opportunities of how you might be able to to finance that nest being investment or design choice that you're making. And it's showing up in prime time everywhere right like networks like HGTV DIY network, the cooking channel, the design network in shows like Flipper Flop, Kitchen Crashers, Christina on the Coast, Man Fire Food, Backyard Staycation, just to name a few. But all these um, folks and TV shows really celebrating this idea of um, outdoor space and what it can mean to people. And then we kind of have this idea of experience I want to touch on. You're probably saying, what the heck's experience? So bear with me just a second. So um, as I mentioned, I was at KBiz this past year, 2020, but the last time I was in K I was at KBiz was when it was held um, in Chicago um, in 2010. And there we were just coming um, off of the recession and we saw nothing like the volume of people and vendors um, that we just saw this year in Vegas in 2020. And I had the opportunity to see um, a very amazing designer. His name is Jamie Drake. I got to see him speak and he was speaking about this idea about experience and this whole sort of buzzword about the idea of experience. And um, Jamie is a renowned designer. If you're not familiar with him, he resides in Manhattan, but his work is known internationally. He has um, some acclaimed clients like uh, Mayor Michael Bloomberg and Madonna, just to name drop. Um, and anyways, 
I was sort of like, what the heck is this experience that he was talking about? And at the time, he described it as having just come off the recession and folks holding tight to their money, uh, folks looking to have meals at home and not eating dinner out. And as a result, in the last 10 years, we saw um, the popularity and rise. Um, excuse me, we saw we saw a change in popularity from um, chain restaurants to now the sort of shift to food trucks and locally owned restaurants and more of this whole celebration of the farm to table sort of movement. And we saw this idea that um, folks weren't going to be going out to the movies anymore or traditionally renting movies. Um, we saw the collapse of Blockbuster um, in 2010 and we saw the rise of Netflix and um, all things streaming. And at that same um, time too, we also saw, if you can believe it, the introduction of the iPad. That iPad, the very first one was introduced back in January, January 27th of 2010, but it wasn't going to hit the stores until April. So a lot of things happened 10 years ago and this sort of idea of shaping experience then, um, flashing forward to experience now. So this idea that experience or over the last 10 years, we've seen the idea, sorry, circling back to the smartphone increase of our use, um, photo worthy, everything on social media, the rise of our streaming apps and being constantly connected to our devices um, at home and at work at Starbucks, even at the youth sporting events that we attend. So what does experience now mean? So that was then, this is now. So the idea of experience now is about recreating those memories um, away from your home and bringing them back to your castle, your domain, your cocoon. So if you want to relive that shower experience from your latest you know, spa vacation retreat to you know, Bali or the West Indies, now you can. If you want to enjoy dining al fresco from you know, your last vacation under the Tuscan sun, now you can. If you just want to recreate your outdoor shower um, from the last amazing beach house you stayed at on the Carolinas, now you can. And I'll raise my hand, that's me. Um, both my parents and my in-laws are retired to the beach and there's nothing better than an outdoor shower, and now I can. Or if you simply want to cook, um, like Chef Jamie Oliver does um, in his outdoor kitchen uh, with his uh, pizza oven, in fact, uh, now you can. You can bring that to your own domain. We also see some additional um, trending factors I want to talk about uh, a little bit as well. Some of those are this idea or concept um, of Sunday forever. We don't want the weekend to end. You know, that grind nine to five is so busy Monday through Friday, and we really celebrate the weekends. And we kind of get to this Sunday, and we just want to pause. This idea of escapism, right? Hanging out um, in our outdoor, outdoor domain is a form of escapism from that daily grind I just mentioned. This idea of evoking rejuvenation, perhaps um, an outdoor shower will give you that sense or peace of mind. JOMO, uh, you've hear, excuse me, you've heard of the fear of missing out. FOMO, this is JOMO, the joy of missing out. Um, folks no longer experience the fear of missing out because they celebrate not going out and staying home. This idea that maybe one year fully relaxed, um, you know, you can be more engaged um, with your loved ones, with your friends, your family. Time is temporarily suspended, again, from our daily grind that we're all so busy with. This idea of the influence of joy and, and what it brings to us, and also that our outdoor space can provide a sense of living a life well lived, because we are all so overworked, um, and of course, we're overstressed and overtired, and um, that adult um, or outdoor kitchen or bath space can also provide us um, with the idea of seeking a more colorful, um, you know, life full of balance and wellness and can also provide some um, adult leisure, um, as it were, as well. Certainly um, at KBiz in Las Vegas, we're all experiencing adult leisure. And speaking of KBiz, it seemed really timely that um, as I was walking into uh, KBiz to prepare for my presentation, Voice of the Industry, and to walk the showroom floor there uh, in the South Pavilion, literally as I walked in sort of staring me, you know, dead in the face was the Caesar Stone booth. And um, Caesar Stone is known for their quartz products. And Nate Perkis was there giving um, a, a speech or a talk about actually outdoor living. He's sitting in actually what is a kind of a faux outdoor kitchen living space that they were sort of launching this idea that um, Caesar Stone was now going to carry and start to distribute 
um, outdoor courts countertops. We'll circle back to that in a minute, but just how timely to have literally walked into that, something I was going to be speaking about, something I'm so passionate about, and here were other folks sharing those same feelings. So I just have um, this quick little, I don't even know if it's like a 20 or 30 second video, just sort of showing some different um, outdoor kitchen spaces, and then we'll kind of get into how we um, go about designing them. Okay, so if you're feeling inspired, let's start with the kitchen. So certainly before we even get to build anything, great design is gonna start with your pen or paper and can be communicated to your clients via 2D or 3D images in the form of floor plans, elevations, and perspectives. And for instance, I'm here at Case, my company uses Vectorworks 2020 and um, SketchUp software. So three different software uh, platforms to communicate our designs effectively to uh, the clients who want to bring their spaces to life. And when we think about the outdoor kitchen, we're going to think of it as sort of in four different areas. We're first going to start with the center of it all, the, the cook zoner area. Then we're going to have um, the prep zoner area, um, plating and garnishing zones or areas, and sort of wrap that up with serving and entertaining zone. And I want to just mention that you could design a very successful outdoor kitchen, even if you sort of omit that planning and garnish zone area. And that would probably largely depend on <clears throat> the size of the space you have available to you, what you're designing around. So this could work very well with three of the four areas if the plating and garnish area kind of had to be omitted just for um, space considerations. So when we talk about the cooking zone or area, you're first going to want to think about that primary focus, which in our outdoor kitchen is going to be the grill. It's going to be the center of everything. And you really want to think about uh, what that material is. What's the size of it, right? Is it 30, 36, 42, 48, or even 54 um, inches wide? In fact, that could be really large. And how will that affect or um, impact your design? That's something to be really mindful of. The other um, couple of items you want to think about is it is it built in or is it on a cart and freestanding? Both will work very well. But something you want to consider also is um, you know, what are you cooking on? Are you cooking on propane or natural gas? Both can have lines plumbed to the grill, though candidly, the propane will burn um, at a hotter temperature than the natural gas. So if you're asking a pro chef, they probably would say they prefer to cook on propane just for the sheer fact that it'll burn a little hotter. You also want to think about if you need sort of any auxiliary cooking or separate cooking functions. Um, maybe you need um, some additional burners for sauteing. Maybe you, it's steaming you want to do outside or frying or pasta cooking. Um, perhaps it's a commercial griddle or indirect roasting pod that could you know, fit um, in your grill as well. And speaking of these accessories, um, we thought that once upon a time, they need to actually maybe be in purchase with a conjunction of these um, these specific outdoor grill assemblies, but because of the increasing popularity um, of outdoor kitchen design in these um, outdoor spaces, you could find some of these accessories at big box stores like uh, Williams-Sonoma. They're beginning to sell some of these um, for far less. You don't just have to buy them from the appliance manufacturers themselves. You're not limited to that, and it could be a good cost savings that you could um, put into your design and execute somewhere else. And if you want to do some additional cooking flair, maybe it's not about the grill or those other cooking items. Maybe it's about the pizza oven. You can cook the perfect three-minute Napoleon pizza um, in something that is more of a built-in application or sits on the counter, um, or even um, a very basic application like a cart. You can have um, that Neapolitan um, pizza at your fingertips and design around that as well. Perhaps it's other things you need for your cooking um, features as well. Maybe you need a commercial wok or a tempeniaki grill. Um, perhaps it's a smoker or a charcoal grill. It's kind of the idea um, that if you're entertaining and you're cooking out here, maybe you're avoiding, um, you know, 
less less trips inside, kind of doing everything at the hub, the center outside, and really enjoying what you have to offer there. And um, once you've sorted out your cooking needs, then depending upon whether or not your um, outdoor cooking is under roof or a structure, um, we need to think about if you need any additional ventilation and by code, depending upon where you are, like I mentioned, if you're under roof or structure, you're going to, to need that as such. So, so check your, your local, um, jurisdictions. I happen to think that this added ventilation look is not my favorite look. So if I could, I would try to design something, um, not under roof. I don't know. It just, it kind of looks a little weird to me. I mean, these are very nice applications. So again, that's just my two cents as a designer. Um, but again, you want to just be mindful of um, your HVAC needs, um, depending upon where you put um, the cooking application. Also, you want to think about your prep zone or area and what does that include? So once you've established the cooking, you've established any sort of ventilation you need, um, what do you need to consider for the prep zone? And along those items, we're thinking about things um, like um, dry outdoor um, pantry food storage. Maybe it's refrigeration. Maybe it's outdoor trash. Maybe it's an outdoor sink or sort of cocktail entertainment space. Maybe it's a prep and waste chute, um, an outdoor ice maker, refrigerator, or dishwasher. And do you remember that if you live in a climate that gets below freezing temperatures, all your outdoor um, water items must be winterized? So just something to think about. And of course, the other idea and sort of concept too is you cannot just place a, um, a an out, excuse me, you can't just place your um, kitchen dishwasher um, outside. You need to be using um, refrigeration dishwashers and ice makers that are rated um, for the outdoor use as well. We talked a little bit about that plating or garnishing area, which you could take or leave. And depending upon how much countertop space you have in your outdoor kitchen, that's kind of going to depend if you need it or if it sort of identifies um, or overlapping with another countertop area. Um, so the idea or concept behind the, 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 the garnish or the plating area is that it's thought to be staged near the cooking, though before the seating. And as I mentioned, depending on the size of your space may or may not be, be feasible. And then, of course, the last sort of idea or concept is you're going to serve and entertain. Does your um, outdoor kitchen or outdoor dining area feature a fireplace or a fire pit? Um, maybe you've included an outdoor TV for gathering or watching your favorite sporting event. Maybe there's a water feature or element um, included, or maybe there is a charming waterfront view to take in. But how are you going to entertain and what's the orientation you're sort of giving that? Now let's talk a little bit about the materials. So we know we're going to focus primarily with that sort of grill, that cooking application. Um, so what's holding or supporting the grill? Is that a base or storage cabinet component or do you go for a more built-in look sort of like what's seen here? Um, the idea that um, the grill is sort of housed in a brick or stone veneer, even um, a stucco application as well. What is sort of holding and supporting that grill application? Also remember when um, designing a more built-in concept like some of these, you'll want to make sure you've properly measured your storage solution face frame and doors for accurate fit and open, openings. Excuse me, nothing would be worse than if they didn't fit in the space. And if you don't consider a more built-in look, perhaps you're designing your outdoor kitchen space um, around cabinetry. So just like our appliances, um, the cabinets really should be outdoor rated. Now, that's not to say you couldn't put an indoor cabinet um, outdoors if your kitchen is, say, under roof or in a breezeway, and it certainly depends on the region that you live in. Um, but in general, outdoor cabinets are going to work best in this application. And when we think about outdoor cabinets, we typically think about stainless. Um, some of the ideas that come to mind might be more of a um, slab or a sort of flat stainless panel look, um, and some can be treated um, with a power coating that can enhance the appearance. We also think about um, woods that wear well outside, like teak or cypress, and um, typically these might be sold or purchased uh, in a natural finish and then left to stain on site by your designer or contractor. Um, also, we could start to look at um, some colored cabinet materials um, that come from high-density 
um, polyethylene materials as well that we could consider. So this idea that you can kind of really get the character and charm of your indoor kitchen cabinets in some of these um, well-executed outdoor cabinet lines. The other idea is going to be um, materials, which I mentioned we were going to circle back to. So probably one of your best bets is going to be to consider natural materials like granite and soapstone. They're going to hold up very nicely. They are um, natural elements as well, and they're going to withstand your outdoor elements very nicely. Um, other great um, selections could include neolith, dectom, or porcelain. Not trying to name them, but just trying to make sure you know, like maybe who to stay away from. Um, but I want to make a mention of that too. If you were considering, again, like a porcelain countertop, depending upon what region you live in, it may or may not fare so well. Um, if you're in DC, like I am, we experience um, extreme temperature swings. So porcelain might not be um, the best idea for a location like mine, but might be more suitable for wherever you are. Um, the Dekton and Neolith um, kind of applications we see more commonly in commercial and residential um, sort of exteriors, even wall cladding in addition to countertops, and they're meant to withstand our weather elements. And I had a note here, it said what you really want to avoid is quartz. And let me mention why. Quartz is not recommended for exterior use because the color can fade over time with exposure to UV light. Um, though in a covered outdoor kitchen space should hold up better, but again, be sensitive to your um, weather and climate where you are. However, as I mentioned um, at KBiz this year, we saw some quartz manufacturers and companies coming onto the scene um, saying that they had sort of worked to um, eliminate that sort of number one fear, I guess, is that sort of that UV exposure to sunlight would um, feign and sort of ruin the integrity of the color, the hue, saturation, whatever it is of the countertop. They're saying that their new products that they're coming out with um, are helping to sort of ward off that issue. So they could be in the running for consideration for, um, for outdoor countertops. Then there's a sort of this whole concept of <clears throat> to shade or not to shade, which is another something to consider. What is the setting? Where um, is this outdoor kitchen going to be located? Is your space going to be exposed to natural sunlight, you know, 24 seven all the time? Is it gonna be shaded by um, some trees or some plant life or some other article or object? Um, will you be designing it in a covered area like a pergola? Did you know you can buy a no maintenance pergola kit? Um, you know, there's just lots of choices um, and ideas and concepts out there. Maybe it's in a breezeway. Maybe you don't even need those things we just talked about. Maybe it's in, in sort of a breezeway area. When I was reviewing uh, this presentation prior to KBiz with our senior vice president, Bill, um, we got to this part about shading and he sort of he sort of brought up and said, how do you feel about shading? How do you go about that? Do you incorporate, uh, you know, any sort of retractable awnings or or things like that? And I said, ew, no. And I immediately thought about the 1980s infomercial from Sunsetter. And I thought, oh, my gosh, how could you spend, you know, tens of thousands of dollars on appliances, on cabinets, labor, design this beautiful kitchen, outdoor kitchen and sort of muck it up with this retractable awning. Um, that was my initial thought. Again, probably not nice, but my initial thought. Um, but the more um, I thought about it, the more I started thinking, okay, well, they've come a long way. So maybe not the image on your right, but if you see more uh, the image on your left, there are several other brands to consider. So I don't think I would totally rule it out um, as an option. Um, and it could be a cost savings um, in my mind as compared to say building a pergola. So it could be a, a great option as well. Then we also want to think about um, our exterior plumbing materials. Not all plumbing uh, manufacturers are going to offer outdoor plumbing in their in their footprint and their brand and their series. And yes, you could consider to use um, that manufacturer's products outdoor, but would you really want to take the risk of using a product that's not rated for outdoor use with your client? That's not a risk I would want to take. Um, you should actually just consider the materials rated for outside. And again, some vendors, just to name a few, um, you know, like Moen, they might make an outdoor rated beverage faucet or LK might make a sink. But I found a lot of success lately um, going with plumbing materials from the actual outdoor appliance manufacturer themselves. Um, clearly, they know what they're doing. They're 
building, uh, things rated for um, exterior use. And at that point, it's not just um, a sink and a faucet. If you actually kind of look at some of these sink and faucet sort of imagery here, they're they're much more than that. They're kind of like um, uh, extension of your your entertaining spaces. These sinks can become ice buckets, become areas to store, you know, your cool beverages and your drinks when they're not in use. So this kind of have a little bit um, more elevated um, use to them, especially if you're hosting entertaining, uh, in fact. Something else you want to consider is where does this outdoor kitchen sit? Where, where does it live? Where does it rest, right? It could um, rely on a, a patio surface that's made of um, brick or natural stone or porcelain pavers. And again, depending upon um, your region or your environment, you wanna be sensitive to what's gonna be the best choice for you. It could live um, on a deck. And in that instance, if you are building um, the kitchen on a deck, that deck would either be a real wood or sort of, sort of wood composite. And perhaps it's something um, thought about um, sort of in the forefront of design when building um, a new home um, or a deck space. If it's something you were adding on or remodeling, you wanna be sure to check and make sure it can support the actual load and weight of the materials as well as the folks gathered in that space. And certainly if not, or if you don't know, your um, contractor can add structure support to support if you're putting this outdoor kitchen on an existing deck that already um, exists. <clears throat> Probably one of the biggest ones or sort of more novel concepts is um, this idea in some of our urban living um, footprints or settings, we can't build out, we need to build up. So it could be a rooftop application. We see many of these um, here in DC where I, I'm from. And if it's a rooftop application, the material underfoot um, is a far greater consideration due to the more harsh and prolonged exposure to the elements that you're going to see. You want to check to make sure that the material warranty includes a rooftop application. You may find that what you want to put up there may not. You want to ensure appropriate um, working conditions too, right? How are you going to get those materials up to what might be a sixth floor um, space that you're kind of climbing to? Do you need a crane to get those materials up there if you can't bring them up through a traditional um, sort of stairwell or stairway or even maybe a client elevator, but they're not going to want those things coming through. Um, do you need to get special use permits, checking with your surrounding neighbors to shut down um, the streets if in fact you need a crane? If you do need a crane, how many times do you need it? Um, I'll show you a video here in just a second, but the last one we did, we needed the crane twice. Um, first to get all the decking material up and the second time to get up all the um, appliances, cabinets, countertops and the outdoor furniture. You want to think about the shade and the need for it um, up there. It's going to be really hot. Um, so it's great to incorporate potted plants and maybe some smaller trees in that instance. And you want to think about the utilities um, again. So in an urban area like sort of DC, yeah, we see a lot of these five-story townhouses. And in these five-story townhouse applications, the kitchen is not necessarily on the first floor, um, more like a beach house or um, footprint, it would be much higher. And um, in our case, the kitchen was on the fifth floor, so they could also see the overlooking views of the city. Um, and that allowed us also to, to tap into um, existing water, existing plumbing lines and draining and things like that. So it worked out, worked out really well in our instance. And here's a little video of my case team working on one of our rooftop deck projects. So if you're wondering what they're doing, that's the second crane they're working on. You can sort of see a little bit of a knee wall framed um, in the front. That's going to um, accept uh, a countertop and overhang for um, folks to sit at as um, someone might be cooking um, at the at the cabinetry and grill. You can kind of see like an L shape there of where the, the cabinets have gone in. But anyways, they're bringing up the wall cladding that's going to cover um, that knee wall there. So kind of a in progress shot there. And sort of this other idea, too, of um, how are you going to treat um, or light your space? Certainly entertaining doesn't stop when the sun goes down. You need, or you're going to, I'm thinking you're going to need, but you're probably going to want um, task lighting at the grill if you're cooking after dark, ambient lighting for entertaining, um, possible under counter lighting to navigate the surrounding spaces and appliances, again, as it gets dark, because no one wants to say the party's over at five, you want to carry it well into the evening.
So to kind of wrap up the uh, kitchen information, some general tips to consider for the perfect outdoor kitchen space. Um, number one, is there a prevailing wind direction? If any, you wanna be sensitive to that when sort of laying out your kitchen space. What is the ideal location for the outdoor kitchen and how close to it is it to your home? What's the proximity of it? Um, the seating, that's a big one, should not be positioned at the back side of the grill, right? Think about opening up that grill cavity back and forth, back and forth. You don't want to have any of your guests seated right behind there. That's not going to be the best thing. It's not um, necessarily like sitting behind a cooktop um, in, an, in an indoor kitchen space is a little bit different. What is the orientation to the sun? Um, you certainly might not want folks um, faced west permanently, you know, as the sun's setting, uh, you know, sort of looking in that direction it might be hard to sort of have an, a nice conversation with somebody. Um, what is the ideal number to host? Um, a minimum or max that's comfortable that you're looking to entertain for. Are there utilities available or how hard are they to get to that space? Again, the gas, water, propane, or electric. Um, as I mentioned, some of the houses we put these rooftop decks on, they're able to um, accommodate that. Others um, are not. In um, in Old Town, Alexandria, where we do some rooftop living, uh, because we can't go out, we can only go up. In some of those more historical homes, the kitchen um, may in fact be on the very first ground floor. So how do we get the utilities up to that rooftop space? It's a little more complicated. And will your design need or include outdoor refrigeration, uh, sealed dry storage, or a sink element um, to eliminate trips inside and out. I think I sort of mentioned that before. What are all those cooking ideas outside? Do you have all those sort of auxiliary accessories? Do you have a sink out there? Do you have a dishwasher, um, you know, an ice maker or beverage storage? Again, eliminating the trips inside and out so you can really celebrate your time spent outside in that space. So that's sort of a little bit about the kitchens in general, and we could talk more about them, but let's kind of uh, sort of switch now a little bit to about the bathrooms. Back to this sort of new experience of, or excuse me, this new definition of experience. The idea, um, you know, of having a spa day is relaxing and rejuvenating, but you can bring back that experience home. It's authentic. It's private, it's personal, it's your connection with nature, and you're literally able to bring that home with you. So in a way, it's now considered um, an affordable luxury at home. And here's a little video, things are like 20, 30 seconds, just um, sort of some bathrooms, a sort of sell, outdoor bathrooms, excuse me, that sort of celebrate this experience, idea, or concept. So I want to talk a little bit of, um, I showed you some experience, some inspirational photos. Let me talk a little bit more um, about inspiration to you. I don't know if um, any of y'all are um, familiar with, um, with, with Lauren Lease. Uh, she is a, a, a fantastic designer located in, in Great Falls, Virginia here. And this is a little snippet from a house she was in about um, two houses ago, and I sort of always you know, admire her design aesthetic, but this is just sort of showing you sort of really raw, really sort of rustic idea of this um, almost like a little Tuscan garden sort of scene area combined with an outdoor shower space too. It's off of her master, well, excuse me, what was her master um, bedroom, master suite on um, the first floor of her, of her previous home, so she could sort of tap into that um, existing plumbing there. We'll talk about um, in a minute more, um, but she writes this really fantastic blog, and um, she, like I said, she's in, she's moved now, I think, two times since the other two homes she's lived in, they haven't been able to sort of recreate or capture this secret garden, hidden oasis, outdoor sort of shower piece she was able to bring to it, um, but in one of her blogs, she writes that, you know, this is one of the details and elements, she really misses it, and she speaks very fondly of it, um, sort of makes her a little sad. She hasn't figured out how to incorporate that um, in her newest home just as yet. I'm sure it's coming, um, but this idea that's just little sort of corner of a yard, really just celebrated by some 
some really inexpensive things. So when we talk about the outdoor bath, I want to think about a couple of things. When I think about um, it's ideally going to be located in um, a well-drained location, particularly the shower, which is probably what we're really going to talk about. Um, proper um, outdoor shower plumbing, appropriate screening, and um, if we're going to place it in direct um, sunlight, if possible or not. So how we're going to try to uh, treat that space. So first you want to think about <clears throat> the location and the, the certainly the, the first thing you want to think about um, and that it's an ideally um, well-drained location. Um, also, before we even get really into the draining aspect of it, depending upon um, your house exterior materials, um, you want to think about where it's going. Think about waterproofing that space as well. Um, if it's possible to place a waterproof liner underneath the existing wall cladding that may exist. Um, so think about that. You could also choose a location that's further away from your home, not off of a mudroom or a master suite or a laundry room or something to that effect. Um, but if you tend to take that shower or the plumbing element further away from your home, that may require a more significant budget and trenching your yard and basically plumbing something similar to what would be the equivalent of an underground um, sprinkler unit almost to get the plumbing away from your home. So you want to be mindful of that. So in many applications, we see something closer to um, that home footprint. And I'm sorry, circling back to the well-drained location, that certainly makes it ideal um, for a great outdoor bath or shower. But what does that mean? Uh, you want to think about what does um, that shower sit on? Um, does it need to be exposed um, to long, prolonged periods of dampness? Uh, whatever is underfoot, you want it potentially to be um, both rot and slip resistant. If you're considering um, something other than like a pebble or a rock, it could be wood, it could be snow, even a porcelain paver. Drainage is going to be your uh, top priority and it needs to channel the water away from your home's foundation. So if you remember nothing else, um, for the ideal drain location for the shower, it needs to channel water away from your home's foundation. Um, I've seen on so many sort of homeowner DIY projects go wrong, they hadn't quite incorporated that correctly, had the water sort of running back into the homeless foundation, not a good thing. Um, depending upon where you live, right, your, your environment, your climate, um, you could go with a direct garden drainage solution, and that would be practical where water just literally runs off naturally and more slowly. This tends to work well where soil has more of a sand content and less of a clay content. So here where I am in DC, we see a little more clay. Um, but otherwise, you need to consider options like a drain well, a French drain, or a shower pan of sorts, again, to channel the water away from your home's foundation. The other thing you want to be mindful, too, is just like our kitchen outdoor plumbing, you want to be mindful of your um, outdoor shower plumbing. And, uh, you know, it's not expen as expensive as you may think. It could be something very basic. Maybe it's just a cold shower, in fact, that um, utilizes the water from a traditional garden hose and connects it to a shower head that's outside. Or you could traditionally plumb this with um, hot and cold lines. But whatever you're using, your materials should be rated for outdoor use and they must be winterized. Again, if you experience um, the seasons that we do here and again, depending upon your climate um, or your region as well. And then we sort of are with this idea of um, privacy, um, ways to incorporate or sort of create privacy, right? We see materials kind of like we saw in the kitchen cabinet arena. We see items like um, teak and um, cedar tends to work best for our screens or partitions or our doors, as well as uh, PVC materials, in fact, too, that you could consider. And, oops, sorry, yeah. So circling back, um, like I said, it was probably two thirds kitchens and sort of a one thirds bathroom, but I sort of want to um, reiterate for um, kitchen and bath outdoor planning. For the kitchen, you wanna be mindful of um, the outdoor kitchen zones, right? We're gonna have four zones. We have our cooking, our prep, our plate and garnish zone, and of course the serve and entertaining zone for our outdoor tips and considerations. Again, is there a strong prevailing wind from any direction? Will your grill be propane or natural gas? Remember, 
um, propane is going to burn hotter than the natural gas. You're seating, right? You don't really want to have anyone positioned toward the backside of the grill with the opening and closing of that grill. What's the orientation to the sun? You don't want folks um, facing west, um, if at all possible, um, for the long term. What's the ideal number you're looking to host um, a minimum and a max? Um, what are the utilities available? How hard is it to get your gas, water, propane, or electric there? And again, will you include any sort of outdoor refrigeration, seal dry storage, a sink element, um, anything to eliminate those trips in and out? Our, I, excuse me, I wrote a note about avoiding quartz countertops as a countertop surface. Again, you might want to consider some natural stones or other materials. But as I mentioned, a lot of quartz manufacturers are coming onto the scene. Just be aware of the exterior use because you don't want to pick something that will fade over time with exposure to UV light. But as I mentioned, they're looking to sort of um, have improved that over time. And will your appliances be built into a brick or stucco veneer application or more of a traditional cabinet look? What's the design aesthetic you're going for outside? And what would the exposure to natural light be? Will you have plants to provide some sort of shade from the elements there too? Also, for um, the outdoor bathrooms, we sort of talked about the idea of why you're recreating this experience for your client. The idea that you're recreating that spa-like getaway from a recent um, beach or vacation trip. Um, our lifestyles we're living right now, we're promoting more of that active lifestyle. We see, um, you know, running clubs and gardening and folks just wanting to be outside. Keeping your home clean, right? So in addition to your personal use and enjoyment, you could be bathing small pets or small children outdoors, in fact, too, not bringing sort of that dirtiness in, into, your, into your home. Um, talk about the inherent need for nature, all of us as humans sort of... Um, sort of um, need and want. And then the idea of bringing the indoors outside, that's what we're seeking to do. And sort of the top takeaways or tips for an outdoor bath location would be to um, place it in an ideally well-drained location. Again, remember carrying that water away from your home's foundation, that's gotta be top of mind. Using proper outdoor um, shower plumbing, things that are rated for the outside. So just like our kitchen plumbing, not all manufacturers make um, plumbing that's suitable or rated for the outdoors. You want to be mindful of that, especially if you have seasons and the need to winterize um, the plumbing accordingly. You want to use appropriate screen and privacy for your outdoor showers or bathroom applications. You want to try to place in some direct sunlight if possible. That's only going to help with the um, prolonged exposure dampness and sort of the drying cycle too. And you want to tie into existing plumbing if possible because it's going to be a less costly application for yourself and your homeowner. That's not to say you can't carry the plumbing element further away from your home, which is going to be a little more expensive to do that. So I think sort of in, in, in summary, I think the idea of the outdoor uh, kitchen or bathroom space can kind of be redefined um, as just affordable, attainable luxury for us these days, right? Luxury used to be identified by the thread count of your sheets and your linens. And now it's your habitat or experience that's unapologetically and, un and authentically yours. And your experience is unlike no others, unlike you know Mrs. Jones or Mrs. Smith's, but it's your kind of the personal extension of your home taken outside in that kitchen or bathroom space. And I just had this little thing I was thinking about, and I just wanna tell y'all, um, I remember when I was a little girl, and if I wanted to do something that somebody else did, my mom would say, now, Allie, if Ashley wanted to jump off a bridge, would you? And I would say to her, no, I don't want to jump off a bridge just because Ashley's jumping off a bridge. Um, sort of her way of telling me I don't need to do or want to do the same things that Ashley or somebody else was doing or the same things that they had. But as design professionals right now, um, that experience um, is what your clients want. They're craving that idea of recreating the outdoor shower from this trip, from this experience, this outdoor spa or this shower that they could have celebrated or shared at, you know, a, a friend's house. How could they bring that home and recreate that something more personal and memorable for them? And I think you as a designer, um, you can give it to them, right? With the right design, the right materials and tools. And perhaps it's something your competitors don't want to get um, involved in or they shy away from. But look at all your great resources that you have to kind of take advantage of to tackle this next big thing. So I hope you found this presentation um, somewhat helpful and I hope you can go forth and you feel like you can um, 
Design Your Next uh, Magazine Award Worthy Outdoor Kitchen and Bath Space with Confidence. And I hope to see it all on Instagram soon. So that's sort of what I have for my presentation. Debbie, I hope you all enjoyed it. Well, thank you so, so very much, uh, Allie. That was great. Really a lot of great information you went through step by step. And I know we do have some questions. So I want to put this out there to you now. Are you ready? Sure. Sure. Yes. Okay. Here we go. Hopefully so, I can answer them. <laughs> I'm sure you can. Um, so let's see. So someone was asking about um, what exactly do you mean by natural uh, gas going back to the grills. Now I know, um, just keep in mind that some areas may not have natural gas um, connected. So maybe you have some different ideas about how someone can utilize natural gas. Um, well, so I, th well, I would say propane like tanks, right, or natural gas, if natural gas isn't an issue, or excuse me, isn't available, you probably also want to be um, mindful of the vendors that you're sourcing these materials from, and they might be able to best guide you in the region, but also in the in the application of what's um, available to you. Because, I mean, largely the grills are going to be um, propane or natural gas. That's typically how they're sold. So if natural gas isn't an option for you, um, maybe propane, like tanks of propane are the better way to grow. Maybe, maybe you can't plumb it, but maybe you can use your propane tanks, um, in fact. Does that help but, at all? Yeah, sure. I think so, because uh, I, I believe the person that asked that may live on an island. So I, okay. I think was a, a thought there. So thank you. And okay. then here's another one. We had an out, so this person had an outdoor cabinet provider that they used yes. occasionally. However, they're no longer making the outdoor cabinets. Mm -hmm. We have some good, good options for traditional cabinet looks that can be used and wear well outside. Any thoughts? So are you asking for a vendor? Am I allowed to say a vendor? Is that what you're asking for? <laughs> throw a couple out there. Yes, I think it's okay. 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 So, um, so for instance, um, I use a company, um, we use crystal cabinets and crystal has an outdoor line called um, quest. And so they offer teak and cypress and a couple of those, um, polyethylene sort of doors I mentioned before, but when I was at KBiz just recently, I was just so taken by this company called NatureCast, and they do a fantastic job. I think all they actually focus on is outdoor cabinets, and they they just do a phenomenal job. Um, we might even be bringing them on um, onto my, um, we might be even maybe considering them at some point um, as an idea here. We were just kind of throwing that idea around, but they had a lot of really great product. And if you're looking to kind of recreate something from a kitchen, but outside, but want flexibility in terms of colors and finish and door styles, um, that nature cast, I think is going to be a really good option. Um, they had a lot of really great stuff to show um, at Keepish just recently. Okay, I think that answers the next question about outdoor <laughs> manufacturing vendors. So um, okay. and obviously, um, I am going to provide uh, Allie's email address. So for additional questions after today, so um, that can be discussed there. Now, so, this is I thought was interesting. Someone made a comment. Uh, and she said, my parents had a metal barrel above and connected to their outdoor shower fixture that used the heat from the sun to warm up the water. Do you have any, oh. thoughts, uh, any thoughts on that? No, I have to look that up, though. That sounds really cool. Um, it sounds like a very green and sort of an industrial thing to do. Um, if that's an opportunity to, to warm up the um, water, if you don't have, um, you know, hot water line out there, that sounds like a great opportunity. How very sort of upcycling and green. That sounds pretty awesome. Yeah, I thought so too. Okay, can you hear me, Allie? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So, let's see. Looking here. So somewhere, I guess, in one of the photos that you had, uh, there was a very large opening behind the. Um, it looked like maybe the barbecue grill and okay. a very high ceiling. So for a very high ceiling, do you still need to vent? Um, above something like that. So isn't that a good question? I think it, it was a couple of factors are going to be at play, right? Where are you building, right? And how strict are your building codes or what they're enforcing, right? Because even just living in the DC area, um, you know, sort of where we are, this heavy metropolitan area, for instance, we deal with um, Maryland code, we deal with DC code, we deal with Virginia code, and you'd think they should all be on the same code, but they're not, right? So I think it has to do with um, what code in your local jurisdiction or municipalities you're working within. Um, and then it probably also more than likely um, has to do with that size of that um the the uh, the grill you're using too right because a 30 inch grill 
may have different requirements than say a 54 inch grill too. Just like our interior sort of cooking applications, our exteriors are very similar. Um, I can't speak to the ceiling height exactly, but I think I would just say check your local sort of building code and see um, what they say. Certainly, I think wherever you're purchasing the appliances from, they're gonna do their due diligence and suggest that it's in a covered area, you do that. And if there's, I guess, a way not to do that because of the height of the ceiling, um, you would check what sort of local code authority and they could advise accordingly, if that makes sense. It does. And so then I'm glad that you mentioned something here. Um, and I know we did talk about this earlier. Can you give us a few names of outdoor appliance manufacturers that you would suggest? Oh my gosh, I would love to. So um, <laughs> I tried to do it in the presentation, but I'm so happy you asked. Okay, so um, one of my favorite ones, we're doing a couple of things with them right now is um, Lynx. They make some really good products. And I say that um, Lynx now Fresco in particular, because they have the coordinating um, sink and faucet pieces. So as I mentioned, you know, you can't just stick any manufacturer out there, sink and faucet and hope it's going to work. You really need something rated for the exterior. So Lynx now Fresco do really good um, jobs with that. Of course, if you're looking at sort of the Sub-Zero or Wolf appliance, you know, sort of suite, they sort of do it all soup to nuts, the plumbing, refrigeration to the cooking. Um, and there's many more out there, but those are, when I start looking at things, those are some of the first three um, that I look at for my um, plumbing as well as cooking needs. Okay, good. And then someone just left a comment here um, uh, about some more issues to consider when we were talking earlier about mm -hmm. uh, the barbecue grill, et cetera. So you, yes. mentioned, you mentioned permitting, so that's important. Um, and then this person also said, thing to consider permitting smoke drift the drain into the sanitary sewer, not the storm sewer, and critters. <laughs> so I just yes, that no, that well, no, that's fantastic too. And again, I think the crit like all those things, but the critters probably especially where are you located, right? Are you in an area that's like very humid, very muggy? You know what I mean? Do you have issues with maybe some unfriendly insects or things like that? Or maybe you know there there's not an issue where you live if you don't maybe your temperatures don't ever reach that high. But no, certainly want to be mindful of and not just insects, right? But outdoor critters too, right? Small little mammals, animals that want to get into what you have going on as well. Yes, you definitely want to be mindful of that. Okay, good. And then here's, uh, you started to touch on this, so I'm going to ask this one. Do you have any uh -huh. suggestions about mold in the islands when it comes to outdoor showers? So, okay, so yes. So I think that some of the best ways to sort of mitigate that from the beginning, right, would be certainly if something is sort of near your home or attached to your home, if you could put any sort of that um, waterproofing underneath whatever is that exterior cladding that you have, check into that with your contractor, if maybe that's a possibility. Um, also mindful of your, of your materials too, right? Some of our porcelains or stone pavers, they're rated to go um, outside a little bit better. They're, they're going, they're, they're meant to sort of maybe even at, not, not adhere is not the right word, but they're meant to sort of like minimize the risk of um, mold and sort of mildew exposure. But I also think a big thing of that is how is that outdoor shower space um, daylighted or what is the exposure to natural sunlight, right? Because if you, if you're, if you have something that has um, direct access to direct sunlight, right, that's going to help with the drying out period as opposed to something um, that's covered where maybe a lot of fresh air, or fresh light, and sunlight doesn't get into it. That's certainly um, going to put you more at risk for mold or mildew issues if you don't have maybe the proper ventilation or proper sunlight um, available to it. Okay, good. So um, just getting real quickly back here, someone left a comment about when we were talking about appliances. Um, mm -hmm. when they wanted to say that people can, for the sinks, people can use the galley, and for faucets, you can use the galley tap, and Waterstone has stainless finish. So mm -hmm. just wanted to mention that. Well, that's and awesome. Then, yeah, and then so here's two more, and then we'll probably have to wrap. But so do you have any thoughts on using concrete countertops for an outdoor kitchen application? Okay, so I do. And if we're thinking in the sense of traditional sort of concrete countertops, I think, again, I think it's sort of all very mindful, again, to um, to your location, the region where you are, right? So hopefully you wouldn't have any like cracking with frost or things like that. I mean, I'm sure you wouldn't. It's not at the ground source. But I would be more mindful of the length of time it takes for it to cure maybe off site and then install it. So like traditionally when we use them inside, right? 
um, we frame and we set the cast for the concrete material, but ideally it's supposed to cure for like six to eight weeks. Some people don't have six to eight weeks. So if it's something um, that you want to do, I think, I think it could work out um, well. I myself might do it more in a covered application as opposed to um, one that's more exposed to direct sunlight, just myself personally. Um, I would maybe consider more of a natural stone. Um, in that instance, but but I think it could be a, I think it, I think it has some merit and could be um, used effectively outside. But again, you want to be sensitive to the to the region you are and maybe some guidance from your your contractor and their experience with it. Okay, hey, good. And then this here's our final question. So um, you didn't mention out, outdoor heating, um, but for those that live uh, uh -huh. or experience the four seasons, <laughs> <laughs> do you yes. have any recommendations for heating to make the area at least a three season um, you hmm. know, situation? Oh, that, you know, that's a good question. I didn't think about that. So something, something really good. Um, so the first thing that comes to mind, right, is if you were using some sort of paver stone or even a porcelain tile, like underfoot, depending upon where you were, um, you know, in, in the DC area, for instance, we see a lot of those applications, people doing like heated driveways now to kind of cut the ice and snow on the driveway, um, thinking maybe you could do something like that underfoot. Um, certainly you can do sort of, um, so you could do you could you could install sort of like heat lamps I guess as they were sort of outside um, that might be a good idea uh, but I guess the I guess the bigger thing is too depending upon how cold it is or isn't um, I guess how are you utilizing that space because I think as I mentioned um, usually we think of it us using those spaces maybe like April to October maybe we get away with maybe late March to November we're having a very warm March right now um, but I guess the idea is what's a reasonable temperature you want to be outside or want to be exposed to that you're comfortable. And does that make sense? Everyone's going to be like a little bit different. I myself don't know if I'd want to sit um, in a space that's going to routinely be, um, you know, maintained at 50 degrees or less. I'm just not sure how how, how high or hot you could get it. Um, but in a three season room, if it was like a three season space, Certainly you can do some sort of like a like a mini split or, you know, Mitsubishi sort of um, type air conditioning or heating sort of element as it were. But um, yeah, I got to give that a little more thought. Now, I'm, I, I guess my thought was I don't know if people would use it for season. Sometimes they sort of bring that activity indoors at that point. But as we're becoming more four seasons, yes, that would make some sense. How do we plan for that for sure? OK, well, I think unfortunately we're out of time, Allie. I have really enjoyed your presentation. Thank you so much. I want to thank you so much for your time, your expertise, and sharing it with everyone. And to thank our audience for being with us today. And I hope everyone has a great day. Thank you. Thank you.